Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see all of you. Thank you for coming today. And thank you guys for uh, joining us today on Daybreak Live. Let's give those guys a hand for watching and being a part of our service. Yeah. So good to have you. So great to have you. I got some really good news this morning. Claudia and I are scheduled to get our COVID vaccine this week. Woo! Can't wait. I just can't wait till that juice gets in our body. What's going to happen? It's going to be exciting. So uh, make, sure you, make sure you schedule that in your own life. Don't put it off. Go for it. So, yeah. So that's what's happening this week in our lives. <laughs> yeah, big, big deal, right? You know, I was looking at the program here a while ago, and I got so excited. I thought, for you that are watching on Daybreak Live, you don't get one of these fancy programs like all of us here, here at Daybreak, but I, I'd, I'd like to just kind of highlight a few things here. We call it the blessing report because it is a blessing. We, we feel blessed, don't we, just to have the doors open here on Sunday morning at Daybreak and to be able to have church and have this great band and have you guys and have Hip Town and Fuel and Flood and, and now we've got uh, the summer salad thing going on Wednesday night. It was, it was a delicious whatever you call it, Claudia. I, I just got to say with Jeff, I don't care what you call it. It was a meal and a half. And I know what you've got ready for this week, I think. It's, I do? Well, I don't know. We'll find out. It's going to be awesome. But uh, we're almost getting more response on our Wednesday night service than we are Sunday service, which kind of makes me like, should I feel threatened about this or what? But... Uh, it's going great. We're glad that people are tuning in and watching it. It's funny, some of the chefs around town now are watching it, and uh, some of these restaurant people that we have friendships with, and, and I know Claudia's even talked to him about joining her on Wednesday night and, and cooking up some of their specialties. So who knows what's going to happen out of it. She might end up with a great job on the, what is it called, the Food Network, Cooking Network? What is that called? She says No. That's what it's called. No. But I was looking at this while ago, and I would just, uh, just real quick for Daybreak Live people. Um, last week, Sunday and uh, throughout the week, we ministered here to over 3,400 people. Now, that's just amazing. 3,400 people. That includes people that were here, people online. And, uh, and then look at the offering last week. Wow, 70000 dollars was given last Sunday. That, that is so encouraging, so encouraging. And then the giving units, uh, volunteers, 140 people in some way volunteered around daybreak last week. That one is coming back, coming back strong. Uh, our connection groups are growing. We, we're starting this new group, this men's group. 30 connection groups met last week. That is awesome. And then since January the 1st, we've had 13 people to enter into the family of God called Save Salvation. Somebody asked me, when are we doing our next baptism? Well, we're going to wait till a little after Easter and we'll be announcing that. But I'm ready to baptize again. How about you? I love baptisms and we're going we're gonna to be doing that again. So, I can't believe, I, I, heard, I heard our next series being promoted and I go, What? This one's already over. The next one's coming. I've got to, I've got to get busy here. But um, I met Bob Goff uh, a few months ago, and just a delight to get to meet him, this great author. And one of his books has inspired this next series. So if you can go online, get the book, read it. He is such a magical person. I mean, he, is just, he just lights up a room, and uh, we're, we're excited to be uh, blessed by his writings and particularly the book that I'm going to be basing the series off of. Well, in this series, we have focused on some very practical aspects of what it means to be in Christ and what it means to have Christ in us. And so today is basically this, how to study the Bible. If this series had nothing else in it but this one thing, it's the one thing that I would love to communicate to you today is to learn how to study the Bible, how to study the Bible. The one thing that changes everything 
Consistent, effective Bible study enables spiritual growth. Spiritual growth that is evidenced by how we conduct our lives. And here's my goal today. We want God's word. We want God's word, the Bible, to shape us, to grow us, and to bring us to that point that God has already designed us to be at in our lives. That's what this is all about. This is what God wants in our lives. Once in our lives. I remember the only other church I ever pastored was while I was in school in Bluffton, Indiana. A little United Methodist church that experienced some wonderful things. A little church that when we first went there was running about 50 people. And by the time we left, we had Sundays that were well over 300. And I think the most exciting thing about that little church was that there were three young men that got saved and felt the call of God on their lives and went into the ministry. And some of the, these guys, one of these in particular, Dave Trahoon, has pastored some remarkable churches, remarkable churches. But I remember in that same town of Bluffton, Indiana, where I pastored, there was another church, and they had a different way of doing church. For example, they had a team of pastors, and, and during the week, they would meet together one time, and they would all bring their Bible, and they would sit around a table, and they would hold their Bible up like this, from what I understood, and they would just go like this. And that was the scripture for the coming Sunday's sermon. It was kind of like Bible roulette. Can you imagine? <laughs> Bible roulette. And they took turns every Sunday. Can you imagine getting a verse like in Leviticus that if you kill your neighbor's cow, your cow's going to be killed. So you don't go around killing other people's cows. I mean, what, what if you got that verse for your, your son? Well, there's some other verses I just decided I wanted to use, but I decided not to because I thought they'll introduce some thoughts here that won't be good. But no way I'm going to kill my neighbor's cow. I'm going to work today to do everything that I can to excite you guys about studying your Bible faithfully. My goal is to give you some life-giving principles that you and I can apply to Bible scripture and to pull out the truth that's inside of those scriptures. As a pastor, it's awfully easy for me to tell you, read your Bible, read your Bible. It's easy for me to do that and even kind of lay a little guilt underneath. You should read your Bible. If you don't read your Bible, it doesn't work. It's got to come to a place in your life we're not only reading, but studying God's word is absolutely a passion of yours. Again, today I want to give you some techniques, some methodology to help you in this area. Very few people know, in fact, I didn't even run this by Claudia, my wife, those of you watching Daybreak Live. I didn't even ask her about this, but people don't know this about Claudia's dad, that when he was a kid, he knew the Bible backwards and forwards. In fact, so much that he was entered into Bible quizzes all over southern Indiana. And I realized that one day when I was going through a scrapbook of her family's life. And there was an article out of the Evansville Press, as I, I recall, about Roy Smith. Roy M. Smith, winner of Bible quizzes. And so he, was going, he would go from church to church and, and meet with other young teenagers and they would have these Bible quizzes and he had large passages of the Bible. Just as a young kid, he memorized large passages of the Bible. Amazing to me, absolutely amazing. I remember Claudia and I in that uh, church I mentioned to you a while ago, we decided that we were really athletic and we decided to ride our bike one day from Bluffton, Indiana all the way to Holland State Park. I wouldn't advise that to anybody today. We did 563 miles. On our way, when we crossed the Indiana-Michigan line there, it was late in the evening. We were riding our bicycles, and we parked our bicycles next to a little cafe. We went into that cafe, and I saw this guy that I had seen on television. His name was Jack Van Impey. 
And I went up to Jack. I was 20 years of age. And I went up to Jack, Dr. Jack Van Empey. I went up to Dr. Jack Van Empey and I said, I'm Wes Dupin. You're the Bible man. He had almost this entire Bible, if not all, he had the whole Bible memorized. Anybody here today have the whole Bible memorized? He had it memorized. You could throw any scripture at him and he could pick it out. He was known as the walking Bible. He lives over here near Detroit, the last I heard about him. Well, to get started today, I want us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This is a very powerful and very important scripture. So if you've got your Bible, your iPhone, whatever, I want you to look it up and get your notebook and take some notes today because I'm going to give you some methodology and some little things that will help you in your Bible studies. It says, all scripture, all, not some, all scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what is true to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. And God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, I'm going to take this verse and I'm going to place it on the screen behind me. And I'm going to put one scripture in the English Standard Version, ESV. It's another translation. The other side is the translation with the Bibles that we hand out here and that most of us read and I study from this one, the NLT, the New Living Translation. And I'm going to put these side by side because I want to make an illustration here that's important. As you look at the one on the left, the ESV, it says here, all scripture is breathed out by God. Breathed out by God. Just say that with me. Breathed out by God. Don't spit on the person in front of you or we'll have a, some problems here. Over on the right side, the NLT, it says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching. So what I want to do, I want to take both of these phrases because they're both important in their translation and they're important to the entire scriptures. And it's important for us to understand these. Number one, all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching. You see, God's word is true. It's true. There's no doubt about it. It's true. And it makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. So part of my point here, if we don't open this daily and we don't really take it serious, we just go about our merry ways, don't we? We just do whatever we want to do. Can you see why they want to get this out of every public school? Can you see why they want to get this out of every public office? Can you see why they want to get this off of our coins? Can you see why they want to get this book out of our lives? They're not trying to get the Koran out of our lives. They're not trying to get the Book of Mormon out of our lives. They're not trying to get the writings of Buddha out of our lives. But this is the one book. And the reason is, is because it's corrective. And people don't want to be corrected. You don't, I don't. We don't just go around and say, please correct me. <laughs> please tell me what's going wrong in my life. You ever do that to an individual? They're not going to hang around you very long. People don't just naturally come up and say, I really like for you to tell me what's wrong in my life. Most of us go around telling what we're doing with our lives and how proud we are of our lives. But God's word prepares us and equips us and shows us time and time again. So it says here in the English Standard Version, all scripture is breathed out by God. And across there is all scripture is inspired. Let's take the word inspired. It means something, by the way, different today than it did when we're reading it right here. I see a beautiful sunset like I did this week. 
I'm inspired. Claudia, come here. Look at this. Look at this beautiful sunset. I hear great music like today. I love to come to daybreak just to watch and hear the band and listen to this great music. I'm inspired by it. I'm inspired. I know that these guys work hard and practice and make a great presentation to honor God first, but to bless you and inspire you. I love to see great pieces of art. And I have two or three granddaughters that are really into art. And they will send me pictures that they're doing. And one, one was done this week. And one was done on Claudia's dad's face. And it was just beautiful, just a beautiful, we've already got it hanging in our house. Beautiful art and very inspiring, very inspiring. The ESV, all scripture is breathed out. This means God breathed out these words. Now, I want you to get this with me because this is vital. This is not a textbook. This is not somebody, I came up with this book and I'm going to try to get it on the bestseller list. No, no, no. This, this is God's stuff here. It's inspired by God. It's breathed into by God. No other book, no other book can claim that. No other book, no religious book can, 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 can compare with this book. This book is a holy book. That's why we call it the Holy Bible. There are no other books in the world. This one's over a billion copies strong. No other book comes close to a billion. There's something about this book. People want to get rid of it that are full of the devil and full of the wrong stuff in their life. You can see why they want to get rid of it because there's something in it that's inspired by God, not man, but God. He inspires these words that were written. Man didn't just come up with this stuff. This is God. This was written thousands of years ago. And, and some of you are saying, well, I know a book that was written even further back than that. But there's no inspiration. Nobody's buying that book. There's something. No wars are ever fought over that book like this book. No people's lives are pushed back against the wall, so to speak, when they begin to read it. These are living, breathing words of God. As I hold this up today, these are breathing words of God. This is God, folks, revealing himself to us. You say, Wes, I didn't know that. I know the Bible is important, but Wes, I'm not taking it that serious. That's why we're doing the series. That's why we're doing the message today. Because in some way, we want to inspire you in a man way what God has already done. I look at this whole Bible here. It's a revelation from God. It's God's story. And he says, I want you to know me. I already know you guys, but I want you to know me. So let's drop in that word inspired. I read the word of God in the stories in here, inspire me. So when I read the Bible, it's quite different, let's say from reading a magazine, isn't it? I subscribe to Time Magazine. There's several, Christianity Today, there's several magazines that I subscribe to. None of them inspire me. None of them. Oh, I learned things. I, I learned some new things. I love to look at uh, Architectural Digest. That's one of my favorite magazines, A.D., I love to look at that magazine. But really, it doesn't do anything for me after I shut it and put it away. There's something about this one. It inspires me. It inspires me. I remember as a kid, mom and dad, they had a Bible. And we did this every night. We had family worship every night. Every night. Mom or dad would put out, pull out the children's Bible. And, and uh, in the children's Bible, there were pictures. I love pictures. And uh, I remember this picture in particular that I'm going to put on the screen. Abraham sacrificing his son. I don't know if that reveals something about my psyche or what. But I love that picture. And I remember seeing that as a kid and just going, that's an amazing picture to me. I'll never forget that picture. And so there were about eight or nine pictures in my mom and dad's 
uh, family worship time that I can still recall and tell you what that picture was about. But here is God speaking to Abraham in through his mind and saying, Abraham, offer your son back to me. It looks so cool to me. Maybe it doesn't look that way to you, but it looks cool to me. Here is God breathing. Just think, God was breathing these words Breathing these words into Abraham's soul, into his mind in that moment. He wasn't a crazy guy. God was breathing this into him. Breathing it. So different from a poem, a prose, a narrative. And I know some people say, this is nothing but mythology. I've had people that look at me in the face and say, Wes, this is nothing but fables and mythology. So what do you say when you... Get a response like that. Genesis says this. In chapter 2 verse 7 it says. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And he breathed. Look at that word again. He inspired. He breathed into. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. Can you see God hovering over I, this is one of my favorite art pieces right here let's put it up there because I want you to see this and think about it for a moment this is God over the top of this person that he's getting ready to call man he's just formed him out of the dirt the clay the dust of the earth and then one last motion he says whoosh. he breathes whoosh. you like that whoosh. He breathes into his nostrils. And life, where did life come from? It came from God, Almighty God. He in, inspired, he breathed into. And man began to move. And man began to form. And man began to get up on his feet. And man began to walk. And man began to raise his hands. And then he gave him assignments. And then he said, you look really lonely to me. And God came back to man and formed out of man a whoa man. Whoa man. You imagine these two naked people walking around. First time they see each other, totally in the buff. There's no sin at this point, by the way. You see, God... He breathed into the nostrils. He inspired. This whole book that I'm holding today is inspired by God. Every word is inspired by God. That's why we're to take it very serious. That's why we're to read it and to study it daily in our lives. Can you imagine if I just set it on the coffee table, on the TV, or on the desk, and I never open it, I never study it? What happens to my life? You say, Wes... You're talking to me today. In 2 Peter 1.20 it says, For no prophecy recorded in scripture was ever thought up by prophet himself. What is that saying? Man didn't make this up. No prophet made this up. It was the Holy Spirit. Breathing. Breathing words inspiring words into the arms and into the fingers and into the ink pen and to the ink. Write that down. Write it down. When you hold this book, there is no other book like it in the world. This is a holy book. There are many, many books that people say, oh, that's kind of a holy book. There's none like this. Again, I remind you, that's why they want to get, they want to get rid of it. Get it out of our presence. Get it out of our presence. Get it out of our classrooms. I remember the public school that I was in, there were scriptures up on a the wall. There were even 10 commandments. I, I, man, do we ever need the 10 commandments? Thou shalt not kill. You see what's happened? We've taken this and we put it over here and I'm talking us, us. How many days has it been? You say, Wes, you're moving into guilt. Okay, okay, I'll come back here. It was the Holy Spirit within these godly men 
who gave them true messages where? From God, from God. I know there's a lot of people out there today, more than ever, saying this is all myth and legend and all of that. We can prove it to you. No, they can't. This is life-changing. This is life-changing. This has been in the making for centuries. For centuries. Centuries. God has inspired has inspired men to write. We don't have the first manuscripts. I've seen some of the earliest manuscripts. Many of you that went with me to Israel, you saw some copies of some very early copies of copies. We don't have the originals, but they think we're really close. And you know what? The ones that we have, we compare it with the earlier ones that we have, and they go, that's amazing. They're just alike. That's amazing. That's God. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. None of it has been altered to correspond to the will of people's belief systems. Now, there have been some people that have taken the Bible and they've started cults and all of that kind of stuff, but eventually those fall apart. David Koresh, he would sit like this with his glasses and with his 34 people, he would sit there every day and he would just read chapter after chapter there outside of Waco. And he developed a cult unto himself. He took the Bible, translated according to himself instead of what God said. And there are people that are still doing that. Still doing that. God breathed into the nostrils of man. The second thing that I see here, scripture is authoritative. Not only is it inspired, but it's authoritative. Now, what does authoritative mean? Authoritative means scripture has the right to speak to you and me and into my life. Again, that's one reason why I want to put it away. I don't want to get too, too involved with it. I don't want to look at it too close. I don't want it to speak too strong to me. I, I've got some things I want to do in my life that just plain me. And so that's why a lot of people, they push it over here, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Authoritative means scripture has the right to speak into me and into my life. And for me to submit to whatever it's telling me to do to make changes. Yes, the Bible is full of stories. It's full of narratives. It's full of prose. It's full of beautiful poems, history. But embedded in all of this, Listen to me. Is the story of God, does that excite you? Is the story of God, the story of God, the story of God and man and woman, it's all right here. It's weaved all the way through. Some of it isn't real pretty, but it's God's story. And there's some things in there where man has rebelled and gone his own way. And he says, okay, I'll let you do what you want to do. But you're going to pay a horrible price for that. Your family's going to pay a horrible price. Let's look at 2 Peter again. For no prophecy recorded in this book was ever thought of by prophet himself. In other words, man didn't make this up. When you hear somebody, well, that's just man. He sat down and, you know, there they are in some catacomb somewhere. And they wrote, no. They had an ink pen in their hands, but that Holy Spirit, the picture I put up here a while ago of God breathing into the nostrils, he began to breathe into these men, and with these fountain pens, they begin to write. All scripture is inspired by God, number one, all of it. I know all of us have a favorite scripture that, well, I don't know about that scripture. All is inspired by God, the pretty and the ugly. Scripture is the authority of God. Again, what, what is the problem we're having right now in America? Right here. Here it is. The struggle that's going on right now in the halls of Congress lies right here. Who's in charge? Whose authority? 
So when we move away from this and put it over here and we begin to quote other gods and pray to other gods in our Congress and we shut this book, everybody's an authority, everybody's in charge, everybody, and then bam, 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 like that. And there's chaos and there's gonna, folks, we're gonna see a whole lot more chaos. That's not prophecy from Wes. It's the same old story that God tells time and time again. He says, you start following your own ways, I'll let you follow, but you're going to end up in a chaotic mess. And we're getting close to that. Some of us are very nervous about it that have very religious backgrounds, and we know what's coming next. We know, we know. We want to blame it on this person, that person. No, it's right here. It's right here. How long has it been since you've opened this? How long has it been since you've taken scripture serious? How long has it been since you've gone, oh, I don't know if I like that one. I'll go to the next page. I don't like that tithing verse. Oh, nobody's going to tell me to tithe. It's all my money anyway. It's my life. It's my job. I'll do what I want to do. And God says, there you go. You close the book once again. First Peter 2, 1 says, so get rid of your feelings of hatred. Don't just pretend to be good. Be done with dishonesty and jealousy and talking with others behind their backs. Now that you realize how kind the Lord has been to you, put away all evil, put away all deception, put away all envy, put away all fraud. Long to grow up in the fullness of your salvation. Cry for this as a baby cries for his milk. So Claudia and I traveled to Turkey a few years ago, rented a Jeep down in Ankara, Turkey. We drove down into the most southern part to Antioch, just on the border of Syria. Couldn't speak a word of whatever they speak. But we could sure use our hands. And I remember as we began to make our way on a 1,500-mile trip in a Jeep all the way to Izmir, we would stop in this little book that we found. Well, right here was this church of Paul. And then we would go 30 or 40 miles and we'd find another just basically rocks. But here, Peter is writing to these five churches in Turkey. These Christians were suffering like we're getting ready to suffer. We're getting ready to suffer, folks. If you don't know this, we are as Christians. 100 million Christians are already suffering in China. And there's literally hundreds of millions of Christians that are now defending their faith. And soon we, you, me, we will be defending the open doors of this church. You guys pay no tax on this property. We're going to change that, and that's already being discussed. You can't do some of the things that you're saying up on that platform, up on that stage. You can't do that anymore. We're going to come down and tell you, you can't do that. You see, we close the book here and we say, well, I guess we'll follow your book. These new Christians, they were suffering. They were, were being made fun of. Have you ever been made fun of because of your faith? I hope you've been made fun of. I hope. I hope there's enough faith illustrated at work, even in your family. Claudia was just telling me this week how in her family she was made fun of, even by her own dad. Say, well, you've got that religion, don't you? That's going to change your life. It did change her life. Look what happened. She got me. <laughs> wow, what a gift. Her dad thought she had gone nuts. Yeah, she had gone nuts over me. I'm just saying to you, you're going to be ridiculed. People are going to make fun of you, especially as we move into this next five years. There's going to be a lot of persecution coming from work wherever you go. And you can make a decision. I'm going to be real quiet about my faith or I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to stand tall and straight. I'm not backing away. Amen? Amen. Got to get a little support on this. 
He says here in the last part of this verse, cry for this as a baby cries for his milk. I had to be real careful when I began to Google this picture that I'm going to show you right now. And this is the picture that came up right off. This baby is crying. I think it's up there. Would you say it's crying for what? Milk. He's saying to you as followers of Christ, there needs to be a passion, a drive, a crave for pure spiritual milk. This, do you have that going on in your life? Do you just hunger? Well, then you pray for it. You say, God, give me a passion not to know more about your word so I can go around and and look how much I know, but that I have a passion deep in my nostrils in my life for you. So how do you crave for that spiritual milk? You say, well, I want to be recognized. I want to be known. I want attention. I want affection. I want people to look at me. I want them to look at my stuff. How do you develop a craving for the Bible? If you're a Christ follower, it's already there. God planted it in you. If you've been saved and redeemed, cry out for more. So I'm going to wrap this up with two little tools that I'm going to give you real quick. These are the ones you want to write down. There's a little tool that you can use called CRAM for Bible study. And I'm going to take each letter here and I'm going to highlight the letter. The first letter is C, create a sacred space. More than finding a space, find a rhythm in your life. You know what that rhythm is between you and God. Find that rhythm, create a space, and follow that rhythm in your life. R is for read the text. Read the text. If that's the assignment for today, and by the way, on Daybreak website, you can actually read the Bible through in a year, and it gives you the verses for today. But R is for read the text. Read it slowly. Read it again. And I suggest to people, always read it out loud. Just read it out loud so your outside ear can hear what your inside ear Read it for understanding. What does that verse really mean? Not just for the knowledge. Not just for the knowledge so you can go argue with somebody at work. No, 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 that's not it. It takes time to understand the meaning of the text. Read it in different translations. That's one reason I love the iPhone because I can sit there and I can look at one translation after another on the same verse. You can do the same thing. How did that verse, how was that translated? A is for ask the questions. I've thrown just a few questions up here to help you get a hold of the context. Who is the writer of this scripture? Who's the audience he's speaking to? What is he saying? What is the relationship of the writer to the audience? Who who is being spoken to here? Who are the characters in this scripture? What is really being said? What is the content that is being said? What is the surrounding information that is going on here? Are there any responses from the crowd that they are talking to, reading to? So, cram it. (laughs) C-R-A-M. I haven't come to the M yet. There are three lenses, as I look at scripture, there are three lenses that I look through. The telescope. I look historically, where we are right now. I look back to Bible times. They didn't have iPhones, folks, and maybe you didn't know that. They didn't have history as we know history today. So you've got to have some understanding. That's why I always love going to Israel and, and Jordan and Egypt and some of these places in Turkey. And, and Greece and Italy and some of these places in the middle, just to get a feel, just to get a little bit of a feel here. And then there's the microscope look. I develop, a, this sounds morbid, an autopsy view. I want to get right down into it. What does that word really mean there in that context? And then the panoramic view. How does the scripture apply to you? How does it apply to me in the big picture, the big scheme of things? How does it speak? What is the truth here? What does it say to me? What do do I do about it? 
Where am I being convicted? Why do I need to change? What sin do I need to take care of in my life? So, C, create a sacred space. R, read the text. A, ask the questions. M is for make a commitment to change. I want to ask you today, are you willing to make a commitment for change this year? You say, Wes, I've had so much religion in my life. I went to catechism. I went to a religious school. I'm sick and tired of all of it. Can I just say something here? You probably haven't been saved. You haven't been born again. But you can be. Religion is dangerous. I tell people it is so dangerous. Because people think they've got the real thing if they go to a certain school, go to a certain class, study a certain way. No, 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 no. Those may be kind of helpful, but they can make you think you have the real thing when you don't. Have you been born again? Those of you who are listening right now on Daybreak Life, have you really been born again? Have you gotten, I say this figuratively, you don't have to do this. Get down on your knees and confess your sins. God, I'm sorry. And you cry out before God, God, I repent. Have you really done that in your life? I mean, really? Have you really gotten to the place where you say, God, I want you more than anything else. My marriage is in trouble. My life is in trouble. My family's in trouble. I want you more than anything else. Not more religion, but you. I want you. The last letter is M. Make a commitment to change. You know, we're in this 21 days of prayer and fasting I don't know what it's doing to you. I don't know how it's working in your lives. I know a lot of stuff is going on in our country right now. But I wonder, have we gotten so caught up with fear? Have we gotten so caught up with news out of Washington that we no longer take this really serious? I mean, really serious? I believe today, one of the greatest steps you could take with your life is to say, not because Wes said it, but what has been said here today could transform your life. You know the only way to get rid of this fear that's going on? I'm really not fearful. Yeah, I'm going to get the shot this week. I'm going to take preventative action. But I don't live in fear. One of my best friends, his daughter suddenly died this week suddenly died this week a beautiful girl it crushed Claudia and I she's on staff at his church she suddenly died we sat there and watched the the service yesterday and we wept we wept but we know where she's at she's in heaven Because she's made her peace with God. She's been born again. She's been saved. She's experienced salvation. Not more religion. Religion stinks. It does us no good. We've got a country full of religious people. We need a Holy Ghost revival where people get down before God and call on God and say, God, we repent of our sins for the way we've been living. We, we, not Washington, we. We've got families that have just gone every which way because we have not led them. We've not done this. I'm not trying to do the guilt thing. I'm just trying to say, do you want to know the truth today or not? Is your heart hungry for God or not? Are you crying out for God or not? Are you to the place in your life you say, God, I want you more than anything else. I don't want more stocks and bonds in Washington, D.C. that's peaceful. I want you, God, more than anything else in my life. Is that real in your life today? Are you just playing a game? I'm here at church playing a game. I'm worried about my bank account, Wes. I could be gone tomorrow. Mine could be too. I'm concerned, folks. I said it to Claudia the other day. I said, we're going to get through this pandemic. And people are going to go, oh, we got through it. 
I said, there's another one coming. And it's going to be huge. Friends of mine are already prophesying. They say it's coming and it's going to be huge. Because this one really did not cause people to repent of their sins. They're still playing the games. Are we ready? You say, Wes, you're fired up. Well, when I see that little baby picture up there crying, Mom, I want more milk. I want to see you guys fall in love with Jesus. Get serious about it with your families. Get your Bible out. Start reading it to your family carefully. Have a lunch with your son, your daughter. Ask them, where is your heart? Well, I don't know where my kids are at. You need to ask them. We need a revival, folks. We can't play this game much longer. It's serious. We got to get serious. You know, I was going to have a song finished here, but we're not going to do it. I'm going to pray. I want you guys to keep playing here because this is so good. I love hearing you guys. But I think about the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Are you doing it? Are you, are you serious about it? Are you just going along with everything? Are you serious about this? Somehow in my spirit, I don't feel that. I don't feel that. God called me here to preach this and preach it and preach it and preach it without reservation. I don't care who comes and goes. I really don't. And some people have been greatly offended by the fact I preach this. People say, where does so-and-so go? They didn't like the way I preached a certain scripture. I had a key person on a Sunday morning was so mad at what I was preaching up here. They got up. They're on staff. They're not anymore. <laughs> I made sure of that. Got out and stormed out of the service. I'm going, isn't that something? Isn't that something just like a spoiled child? I'm not going to follow that. I don't believe that way. I don't like the way he's telling it and preaching it and teaching it. Folks, we're going to have to get serious about our faith. Our country's in real trouble, and we've allowed it. We've allowed it. Our country is representative now of what our families are like. I say to you today, are you willing to make changes? Are you? Are you? Well, I'll be glad when we get back to the restaurants. I'll be glad when we go back to Disney. I'll be glad when I don't have to wear a mask. I'll be glad when we can uh, do the things we used to do. No, 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 no. What about God things? What about God things? You just come here because, well, it's kind of a good thing to come here. Sure hope notice, somebody notices I'm here today. I do. I notice that. What if we really got passionate like the little baby? God breathed into this. Said, do you take me serious? Do you read it? Do you read it? Not for other people, but for yourself. God, what are you saying to me? Lord Jesus, we come to you right now, and I just pray for people that have drifted so far away, like the Laodicea church in Revelation. They've just grown cold. They're not making really any sacrifices spiritually with their lives. And God, we call right now in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit that there be a spiritual awakening right here at daybreak. I know we've drifted. I know that. I can feel that. And I just pray that today that there would be individuals who would say no more. I am by the help of God. I'm recommitting my life to you. I'm going to get serious about your word. And not only serious, but I'm going to follow it. I'm going to start following as the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to live by it. Because I know it's truth. I know you've inspired it. I know that you've breathed into it. I know that you gave it to us as your story of your love for, for us. 
Lord Jesus, I pray that there would be a spiritual awakening that would go coast to coast, that would sweep over this community right here that is gospel hardened, right here, right here in this community that's very gospel hardened. Lord, that there be an awakening that would just shake us to our boots, that would cause us to realize we can't control all the stuff that's going on right now. We better get right with you. God, I pray in your name that this would happen. And everyone shouted together, amen. amen. Wow, I didn't mean to get into that revival tone, but I just about halfway through, I just felt something like, Wes, kick it up a gear or two. Folks are ready. They're ready. They're ready. They're ready. They're ready. Go ahead and push them off the high dive. That's what I've been trying to do here today. Just push you off. Let's get them. Thanks for coming today. God bless you. Thank you guys for coming on Daybreak Live. We'll see you Wednesday night.